resistive sensors okay you might have already like you know, seen or maybe you might be seeing for the first time i don't know um, so so these are uh, typically the strain gauges okay uh, are resistive sensors so what what people do is like you know they they lay down this kind of a architecture of uh, like a wire which is running across this uh, um, patch of the sensor and um, this wire is actually uh, some kind of a metal okay which is laid on the some small very thin kind of a um, plastic substrate hmm? and uh, when you when you like you know, stick it to some metal or some place where you want to sense the strain then uh, when it is stuck there and you start like you know, bending that beam or say, say, say for example you have your uh, steel ruler that you use for measurement um, that steel ruler like you know, if you imagine this uh, patch is stuck on that steel ruler at one end and uh, you hold that end uh, firmly um, and then like you, know, you apply some kind of a bending force at the other end then like you know, the strain that will happen at this end will get sensed by using this uh, this tube strain gauge sensor now you might have seen this formula principle and uh, so the principle of operation here is just like you know that um, uh, the resistance value okay r which is equal to rho l by a okay where rho is uh, resistivity um, as the length changes delta l change in the length will cause a change in the resistance Okay, that is the basic principle on which this uh, typical strain gauges or metallic strain gauges are based on. Okay, uh, so typically the gauge factor will be uh, 2 for the metals, but then there are some other kind of a ways the, the, the resistance in the material can change. So, if you have the resistivity change itself, row change itself happening, um, then your your gauge factor can be enhanced uh, to uh, higher values okay so nowadays there are sensors that are coming up in the market which will have a much higher like you know, gauge factor um so so these are what kind of sensors can you think they are analog or digital yeah they are analog sensors right there is nothing like you know digital here so you apply the voltage and like you know in some kind of a western bridge kind of a configuration and uh, you give the strain and then continuous change in the voltage will will happen at the, at the output of the the sensor and then uh, to kind of interface it with microcontroller you need some kind of a um, conversion of analog to digital and then you can interface it with that there will be some of the issues when you start practically using these sensors uh, the, there will be temperature considerations there will be noise issues and uh, then if you want to use whether you want to do single axis kind of or single sensor kind of a measurement or you need to kind of use uh, what kind of a configuration that you want to use like you know that uh, depends uh, so so we'll see some some i'll post some material about that uh, in the in the thing to kind of you to refer to and see um, half bridge configuration full bridge configuration you know what are the formulas that are available uh, there, they are directly available. One can derive them by using Kirchhoff's laws, but like no, we, we don't need to get into probably in in details. I mean, it's just an application of Kirchhoff's laws and like uh, using that for uh, finding out some some output for the strain gauge. Okay, that kind of exercise. So this this table I'll post in the in the models, uh, you know, our notes then uh, you can have this more advanced now semiconductor based strain gauges say, say silicon for example uh, when used as a as a strain uh, sensor uh, the, the basic difference is that we are not just dependent upon the length change there okay so suppose we, we lay like you know the silicon strain gauge uh, 
um, then uh, the difference from the metal is that uh, like you know in the formula you have a, a rho l by a as a resistance right so rho is a resistivity now this resistivity itself changes in the in the semiconductor strain gauges okay so it's basically uh, based on the uh, principle of like you know the the flow of electrons that happen inside the semiconductor okay so that the distance ch change like you know for the electron to jump from one one kind of a uh, molecule to other molecule to kind of like you know create a flow path that change itself affects the resistivity okay in the in case of uh, semiconductors in case of metals you have a free, free electrons so there is no such kind of a need there but in in the semiconductors you'll, you'll have that kind of a possibility happening and uh, based on that you can create like you know, very like you no know, very very highly sensitive uh, strain gauge sensors uh, based on the semiconductor principle and uh, that sensitivity is 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 important um, uh, for the noise considerations so if you have very highly sensitive sensor then like you no know, typically the the sensor to noise ratio can be minimized okay so that is a principle that one can use uh, for for having a um, to deal with noise in some way then we can have uh, particles of uh, conducting material in some non conducting polymer okay that can also create some kind of a resistive sensor which will have a uh, very high gauge factor possibility okay the same principle like you have a polymer matrix in which the carbon particles for example are there and carbon particles are conducting or convert carbon nanotubes for example or like graphene for example there is con that is a conducting domains in non conducting material so the, the the i mean the boundary is very very small i mean it's not like no very uh, far away kind of a boundary it's like a dense packing of these um, uh, particles in the in the polymer matri matrix and just the electrons have to jump between the in, in the gap that is created uh, by the polymer between the two say uh, carbon nanotubes for example and uh, this jump uh, will be kind of uh, creating resistance for the path and as you bend uh, or as you kind of give a strain the 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 the, the length of the jump starts increasing okay so amount by which the electron has to jump to kind of like you know get to the next kind of a conducting path that increases and that because of that you can imagine that you know small increase in the distance will have a large kind of a uh, you know uh, possibility for the um, large voltage needed for this jump to happen in, in some sense so so the resistance change would be like you no know, very drastic for a small even small change in the in the strain so this is how the 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 newer ways of creating these uh, strain gauge sensors are are typically uh, coming up in the in the market okay uh, so so think about this question are like you know can you have a digital strain gauge possibility or like you know the output of the strain gauge can be digital hmm? so so think about this okay and uh, so so once you have some kind of a ways of like you know thinking uh, this classification can we see okay oh, oh can i have like you know this digital domain sensing possible that can open up some some interesting kind of innovative ideas in in your mind so these are like you know some pictures of actually these strain strain gauge sensors for like you know different kind of configurations and and uh, and uh, making sure like you know we want to measure something um, say torque measurement if you want to do then like you, know, you place it in some uh, so these are kind of called uh, called a uh, rosettes strain strain rosettes okay so the multiple sensors put together to get a specific kind of a uh, measurement done then you can have a capacitive principle to operate okay the basic principle of capacitance you know uh, is uh, epsilon a by d so this a is the area of the capacitor d is a gap between the two electrodes that are used in capacitor so you can have uh, many different kind of configurations here flat plate configuration cylindrical configuration and things like that 
and uh, typical application capacitive sensors are used is in the displacement okay so uh, there is a, no, normally this formula is applicable when there are no fringe fields but like you no know, typically there will be like a fringe field from here to here uh, from plates the side of the plates like you know, the the um, electric lines okay um, or lines of electric field may not be uh, completely going straight from the corners in the corners may they, they may have some small bend that is happening okay so this bend will like you know contribute to some some change in the capacitance which is not captured by this formula but uh, typically that may that may have to be done uh, in, in in or dealt with in some way in the, in the application depending upon how much accuracy that you would need in in, uh, in these measurements okay so uh, one of the examples of this capacitor sensor is this uh, um, this way of doing things where like you no know, you have a surface which is electrical conductor and uh, but it is not participating really in a in a in a capacitive measurement uh, um, actively in in some in some way so for example um, you you have this uh, measurement electrode which is kind of giving the field okay so to avoid fringe fields they have this additional kind of a secondary electro screening electrodes around here okay and then there is a ground okay so this is like how the they place typically the, the the sensor elements in the in the system and this electrical conductor is where like you know the surface which from which we want to measure the uh, distance of the probe see this is a probe here okay so this electrical conductor is 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 uh, is grounded so that you form a capacitance between these two so that way it is it is active part of the sensor but um, uh, it is not really like you no know, you don't need it to be uh, constructed with sensor you can kind of have this probe separately and then like you know, just put a ground on this electrode and then like you, know, you you form this capacitance here and this can be extremely like you no know, high sensitivity uh, displacement measurement possible here so typical displacement measurement with these uh, units is uh, um, can be possible to the extent of some few uh, nanometers okay not just tens of nanometers but like you know some some five or ten kind of a nanometer less than ten nanometer kind of a positioning uh, can be sensing can be possible with such sensors we do have such sensor in our lab i mean whenever you want to in the future you want to kind of like you know take a look at you'll be able to kind of amaze to see what how accurately and uh, nicely it gives the, the, the positioning data uh, maybe i would post like you know, the, the data sheet also for such a capacitive sensor i'll post it uh, to the model to uh, to watch okay uh, these are like inductive sensors where uh, you might have seen these already this is called linear variable displacement transducer okay lbdts okay they have this primary coil and uh, primary coil is excited and secondary coils is where we are measuring the voltage and uh, uh, this uh, this uh, you know the magnetic core when it is moved inside then the couple coupling of the voltages to these secondary coils changes that is the principle this uh, lbdts are based on based on okay so these are like you know, some industrial lbdts that are uh, there in the in the market uh, and these are also very extremely um, high resolution kind of sensors can be possible with lbdts okay then in the optical domain you you can have uh, this is a very very uh, what you say interesting or important sensor for a uh, lot of mechatronic systems okay encoders okay so these are different from the encoder word that is used in the electronics domain okay so we need to be careful about this mechanical this is mechanical encoders where you want to sense a position then like you no know, you do this based on the principle uh, as as demonstrated in this figure what we do here is like you no know, we have a light source here and then the light uh, uh, detector on the opposite side and there is a wheel which is having the slits okay there are some dark portion and some bright like you no know, the, the transparent portions 
to some opaque parts and some transparent parts uh, okay or some gaps okay either way uh, so uh, when the light uh, s like uh, when, when so this is powered up uh, no light is powered up and like when it receives the uh, detector receives the right uh, to, to begin with maybe and then like you, know, you start rotating the wheel and the light will get cut by the wheel okay as the light gets cut uh, the detector will respond to that uh, this is a light detector so it will when the light is not falling it will kind of respond and give some signal and that's how like you know, one can get a, get a signal out of this uh, different sensor so you count this number of pulses that are coming on this uh, light detector here um, and once you count like you know, that, that count will indicate the position of the of the wheel now the question is like uh, how do you kind of uh, sense the direction of rotation okay so we'll come to that in a, in a minute um, but think about like you know, how do we sense the direction okay if you did rotate in this direction or this direction only the thing is that ha happening is that you know, the, the light is uh, getting cut I mean and, and you are registering some pulses there okay so so for there is very interesting ideas that are used for for getting the direction sensed okay we'll come to that uh, so this is one kind of a sensor which is called which is of the incremental type okay it just gives you incremental information about the displacement so you can count the number of pulses you get from some reference you will get to know the total displacement but you don't get absolute displacement here so there could be possibility of absolute uh, inference also but i mean it's very people not i mean that that is not very uh, widely used. It's very rare to use this absolute encoders. Um, although their, their, their construction is a little uh, difficult, but but we maybe we'll have a chance of looking at some some kind of a, a principle and like you know, how their absolute encoders are are designed. Um, so so you can have a linear possibility for sensing, or you can have a rotary possibility for sensing. Okay with the encoders okay so uh, in the linear case there is a scale which is uh, having these strips okay on the surface now as you can see here we are having this transmission kind of a principle in so same thing can be possible if i have a reflective principle here so that like the the, the, the light reflects from some surfaces and comes back so that i can i don't need to have this kind of a complete uh, uh, pathway for the light so that uh, this uh, um, rotating wheel needs to come in the path rather than like you no, know, I can put this uh, light detector on the same side as the light source and have this uh, source and detector act in a reflective kind of a mode so the light falls on some surface and reflects from the surface and getting registered that is a tip principle typically used for the linear encoders okay where they have a linear encoder head which is uh, running on a scale that encodes the, the, the like, mm -hmm. that uh, that gives some kind of a um, that encodes the the strips. I mean the the, the position scales. Okay, um, so so the idea is like you shine the light on this scale and you take the reflection. There are some reflective parts and some transparent uh, non-reflecting parts on the surface of the scale. And uh, that's how they, you, know, you have a distinction between the two parts. Now there are many different additional principles that can be used where this uh, reflection happens as a as a reflective grating kind of a okay. If you have these reflective parts very very tiny, then the the, the light starts behaving in a very different way. Okay, uh, so so this has uh, different kind of a uh, repercussions uh, for um, you know actually this becomes a little more complicated to. Uh, do the encoding in a sense uh, uh, so the, 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 the thing that is coming out from the uh, although the strips has like say one micron kind of a line spacing the spacing that is registered by encoders will be or, or your sensors may be different based on like you know the grating uh, or the diffraction patterns that are produced uh, by reflection from such a small distance. See, when the distances are larger, you don't have the light diffraction effects. But uh, when the distances get like more smaller and smaller, then you'll have typically you'll have to deal with the light uh, diffraction effects, and then consider that in in your analysis or 
your calibration or your uh, detecting your output of the sensor uh, whatever you want to say uh, in rotary there are these two possibilities i have been told you absolute and you know, incremental the linear encoders can also have a uh, absolute uh, encoding possibility but um, not not very widely used at all um, now we come to this question how do we sense direction of these uh, pulses okay there are just pulses that are coming then like you know, uh, how do we sense direction so the idea is to use uh, instead of one we use two sensors and uh, the two sensors are put in such a way that outputs of them are 90 degree out of phase with each other okay so uh, that has two advantages one is that it is and it enables the detection of direction and other advantage is um, it uh, enhances the resolution you know you are putting instead of one sensor you are putting two sensors which are out of phase then like you now you are you are expecting like you know that resolution also will increase because we have two sensors now okay uh, the third sensor may be put if you want to know like uh, that is called incremental pulse that you want to uh, or uh, what is sorry this is a um, over one you complete revolution you get one single pulse okay so that is a output that you get uh, it's is is defined as i output output i for the sensor and like you now these two phase like you now outputs that are coming they are phase a phase b uh, that is what is the standard terminology that is used in the in the encoders domain okay so we'll see now this uh, a and b pulses that are coming and um, this um, increment of uh, of a revolution okay that is i pulse will will typically be a sim simple single pulse that is coming also we don't need to look at in more details we we'll look at this 90 degree how this 90 degree phase difference helps us detection of direction is what we need to kind of focus on now okay so imagine that you have this uh, um, two sensors which are uh, two pulses which are coming as the as a rotation happens so um, so in this particular case like uh, if you see at position 1 you have a uh, like you know you have 0 0 output a and b. Uh, b is switching to this but like okay let's start with some other position where yeah, they are both 0 Yeah, maybe maybe we can start here itself. Okay, so, so say uh, it's just like you, know, you can consider that like, you know, just before this red line. Okay, what is the position? Okay, what is the uh, thing that will get recorded? Okay, so uh, that will be zero zero for for this. Okay, so if you imagine like you know, here this is zero here and this also is zero. Just before this red line. Okay, this timer timing marks I I, I put it in a so so the, in a way that you know we can just kind of like think in the same kind of a logic in every every, every red line case okay so you see here this is a zero zero here then if you go for the next position okay then uh, a is still zero okay but b has gone to one okay we are now reading just before the red line okay so red lines are drawn where the transitions happen but we 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 need to kind of be consistent with where we kind of like you know, consider this uh, phase output okay so uh, second third part like you know, you'll have one one here and fourth part you have one zero here okay this is how like you know, these pulses are coming now uh, you need to imagine that when the direction is reversed okay so uh, when the direction is one uh, in the forward direction these are the pulses coming when the reverse direction happens okay so uh, say for example um, you you have these uh, strips which are or this uh, this this requires a little bit of imagination or like you, know, you need to do a little bit exercise you can take a pause here and then like you know, um, use the slits as I have shown here in this diagram and like you know, put actually the the two sensors. 
uh, no, such that like you, know, you have the uh, A and B output coming as shown in the first kind of a way. Okay, when the forward direction motion is happening. And now, if the direction of the wheel is only rotated, the sensor position is just kept, kept the same, then what kind of a signal that you expect to come here is what we want to understand. Okay, so do that little bit of exercise by pausing up here, and then, like, you now you will find this. This will we'll, we'll again take this little bit of a discussion when we, when we talk about uh, in the discussion class. Okay. So this is uh, this you, you may or may not be able to crack it at this point, but um, yeah, just give a give a fair try, and then we'll come back in the in the class to talk about this. Okay, so we'll do that. So uh, is like a clockwise direction of rotation, and then like you no know, the 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 anticlockwise some direction of rotation will have like you no know, the output produced in this kind of a fashion. 0 0 followed by 1 0 now and then 1 1 and like, no, 0 1 so based on this like okay 0 0 is followed by 0 1 or 1 0 you will you, you, you can say that the direction of the incremental encoder can be found out okay so this is how one can go about getting the direction okay by using these uh, uh, 90 degree phase shifted signals and seeing like you know how they are coming with respect to each other okay so uh, so you think about and then like you no know, if you have doubts we can take up in the in the discussion class then you can have uh, something called moir fringes you might have seen like you no know, if you have this uh, uh, gate which will have uh, so say or basically some kind of a um, mattress for example or gate uh, which which is having these bars which are vertical and like you no know, you run run like you no know, the other two other kind of a set of bars uh, which are um, slightly at an angle to it and you start kind of moving around you can see these kind of a fringes fringe pattern coming okay so you can simply like um, maybe we, we have a Experiment, maybe I can show some experiment uh, or uh, see, the, or maybe is, is it difficult, or maybe some video, maybe you can see. Okay, see, it's basically like you now you have these parallel kind of a lines drawn on the surface, and then uh, you are moving uh, with an angle these lines uh, with respect to each other, and then, then there are some kind of a patterns that you see called, called moil fringes. Now, this effect also is used in many different ways uh, in, the, in the research uh, these days. Okay, so these diffraction effects will, will give these kind of patterns. Okay, so one can use these patterns to kind of do the, do the sensing. Okay, for example, for very small motion uh, at a for very small angle between them, these patterns will start moving very fast actually. Okay, so even for the small motion, these patterns will move in the perpendicular direction fast, and that can be a, a source of uh, information or sensing uh, in, in optical encoder based on this principle okay all right um, then this is another kind of like we can have more kind of a complicated uh, examples where we are using some kind of a light path with the uh, additional light elements uh, reflecting elements or you know the, the mirrors and things like that or beam splitters and things like that to put together like you know, very highly sophisticated sensors okay so that is a, that is possible. Okay, so this is the sensors we we use in long back, like in my PhD days, we have used uh, such a kind of a sensor. Okay, uh, then in autofocus cameras, you can have these different kinds of optical sensors. You can see these are this is a uh, SLR camera in which uh, uh, you you have this uh, array of um, uh, you know CCD. Okay. And the CCD will record like a um, image, and if the if the image if you are uh, so this is just an example of some pattern that is uh, imaged by the CCD. Okay, it may not be you may not have always this pattern. You can have whatever image you, you are focusing on uh, at that time. But I'm just kind of like you know, this. Suppose for such a kind of a pattern, uh, you you see the the the. Um, 
left part is a blur part of the image and you don't have very sharp distinction between like you know see if you see bottom side that's a that's an array of uh, uh, ccds okay uh, so these ccds are actually acting giving this output which is blur in the sense like you no know, you don't have a sharp kind of a, a distinction between the two adjacent ccds okay so uh, as you start moving the lens and the image starts becoming clearer you get this distinction very sharply so sharp boundary is found and that's why that's when like you no know, the the smartness can build build in the in the system to say that okay oh, now it is in the focus okay so uh, the more is it contrast in the in the ccds and like you no know, sharp kind of a lines that you find in the on the ccd then you can say that okay this is uh, images in the focus okay so like that you can have this uh, auto focus uh, sensing possibility then uh, there are these magnetic sensors which are based on the hall effect principle the principle is very simple you have the semiconductor which is uh, like you know uh, flowing current in one direction so this is a direction of current in the in the semiconductor and then um, you you have a magnetic uh, flux which is uh, applied in the direction perpendicular to it and then um, you'll find that like you know because of the flow of current and in this magnetic field which is perpendicular to it the electrons will get deflected in 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 the in the in in one direction okay and that deflection of electron will create a charge on that side okay so that charge is basically sense for the hall this uh, is called a hall hall effect okay so this is a principle that is uh, that the hall effect sensors are are based on okay so cd rom spindle motor see these hall effect sensors are used in a lot of these bldc motors to sense like you know the the magnetic field a magnetic flux uh, happening in the system so some kind of a feedback mechanism is is that based on that okay so we'll see some some examples as we go along when we open the cd rom drive you no know, the spindle motor we'll be able to see this hall effect sensors and then these are it's another example for the car window opening operation okay then uh, then we can have a piezoelectric sensors based on the piezoelectricity principle so this is like typically like the charge that is generated on the surface of a piezoelectric element when when some kind of a uh, force is applied okay uh, so you have uh, two possibilities one is you can apply the force and generate the charge or you can have a uh, uh, give a charge and like you no know, generate the force okay both based this uh, piezoelectric sensors work typically okay um, so there are these typical materials which are used as quartz or pzt or the pvdf these are different different kind of uh, materials that are used and nowadays people are using this piezoelectric uh, as a uh, energy harvester harvesting elements so you can have a some kind of a small micro cantilever that is sitting in the on the sensor itself and uh, it senses ambient it's, it's not for sensing with the ambient vibration it is uh, vibrating and because of that vibrations the 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 charge is generated okay so so the the energy of this vibration is converted into the electric energy in form of this charge and then like you no know, you can use this charge to store this electricity and use it for the for the powering of the sen sensor sensors okay so so one can have this wireless sensor nodes based on this kind of a uh, idea so idea is that the sensor is sitting in some industrial environment where some vibrations are based on those vibrations it is generating energy to sense uh, to power itself okay so the sensor doesn't need a extra battery or any uh, you know solar or other kind of a power uh, source to be there with the sensor it, it can in the industrial environment whatever vibrations are it is generating a power for itself from those vibrations okay that is a kind of idea that is used in the piezoelectric uh, energy harvesters okay and as well like no this is principles of piezoelectricity is uh, going to be uh, important uh, and they are used of course they are used as a sensors in the in the, in the accelerometers for example and they are used as sensors in say pressure sensing kind of applications okay so i think uh, this is one of the uh, applications of uh, piezoelectric kind of a pressure sensing okay 
then uh, maybe we can uh, now pause here for this lecture i think there is uh, we have spent good amount of time over uh, you know pondering over these uh, fundamental principles um and then maybe we can like you know start uh, in, the, in the next class with some other kind of a uh, aspects or other elements of mechatronic system okay so and then mem space sensor I'll, I'll talk briefly about some in the next class and you know uh, we can move on to the actuators from there okay so for here we will we'll stop now